Hi, I'm John Zombro with the Lifetime Athlete, and thank you for joining me in today's video. We're going to be calling this one Backpack Considerations for the Backcountry Hunter. I've been a hunter for 50 years. I've been working in human performance for 40 years, and I had to think about this. I've been hunting in the backcountry now for 35 years. And whenever I go at these types of discussions or topics, I like to bring the perspective uh, of being a physical therapist and being a performance coach and think about the energetics and the biomechanics and the ergonomics of how we interface with our gear. And so that's what I'm going to try to do in today's discussion. And I'm going to begin with a bit of history. When I first got started hunting in the backcountry, a lot of what I did was hike in some number of miles and then hunt from essentially a backcountry uh, spike camp. And a lot of that would be just with a pack frame or an external uh, frame pack. And then along with that, I would usually you know, hunt with a very small day pack or even some variation of a fanny pack. And there were there were some pros and cons with this approach. First of all, it was relatively economical, um, easy to get most of the gear on to this pack and get it where I needed to get it. These packs are great for hauling meat as well. And then some of my day hunts were exceptionally comfortable traveling relatively light, but one of the drawbacks is now you've got two packs and you're always trying to go back and forth and figure out what's going on. And you have to have a few extra straps uh, for gear with this type of a setup. Uh, so as time went on, I evolved and I moved away from using this type of system, particularly as uh, equipment got better. And I found myself moving more towards wherever I could using a larger day pack. And uh, this one is a Horn Hunter. This was a great pack. I've used it for a number of years. In fact, I used it so much, I actually wore out the lumbar pad and had to get that replaced. But uh, these packs are great in that, you know, you can, you can cover a lot of ground and have enough gear with you. They do have, this particular one has the ability to put a lot of things on the outside. So I could, I could actually, when weather was warm, be comfortable for almost a weekend using this pack. But what a lot of people will say is, oh, you know, my packs, it, it's comfortable, it feels great, I don't need a fancy pack. And I would say that's almost true of any backpack if you have 25 or 30 pounds in it. And that was very true of this type of pack. 25 or 30 pounds, it's extremely comfortable and uh, would serve me quite well. But unfortunately, when you have to haul meat or an elk rack or something like that, these types of packs just don't quite have the load carrying capacity and suddenly your neck and your back are going to be feeling it. So a lot of times when I'm talking to clients about uh, their trips and certainly we're dealing with their conditioning and their fitness and their health and all that stuff, but we're also talking about gear. And so for ruck training, I like to usually make sure they've got a little bit better pack or even use an old frame pack for some of their training. Um, nothing wrong with these types of packs, but generally when we want to carry more and be more comfortable doing it, we need to move up and pack it. So that's what I did in my journey. And I found myself for a while using the this particular pack. This is a backpacking style pack. It's a Mystery Ranch Glacier model and great, great pack. Actually, they have some more hunting specific models like the Metcalf, but this one being the Glacier worked fairly well. I could uh, take trips, do a lot of things. And one challenge maybe was uh, um, when I had meat uh, in game bags, it usually it was going to go in the pack, and sometimes that was simple, sometimes it was an issue. Uh, these packs are sturdy and long-lasting, great wearing, a little bit on the heavy side. So finally, I wanted to move into um, the dedicated hunting packs. As they started to become available, the lightweight hunting-specific packs, which are designed uh, specifically to uh, you know, 
backpack in, compress small for short trips, expand for larger trips, and have that ability to carry meat. So that, that gets into probably what are some of the uh, higher level pack offerings that we have today, and that's from companies like uh, Kefaru and Stone Glacier, Seek Outside, Initial Ascent, Exo Mountain Gear, and I'm going to put Kuyu in there as well. They've been a good brand for me. Some folks would not consider them to be top tier but I have uh, found otherwise. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the packs that I currently am using uh, quite a bit. This one's been around for a while. This is the Kuyu Icon Pro 3200. So it's kind of the that cross between a larger day pack or a smaller excursion pack. And if it's going to be, again, nice weather or maybe just a weekend, I can do fine with this. One of the things I like about this pack is it's got a ton of great pocket configuration. So it's got a, a pocket here, it's got a, a pocket in the top, a pocket within that, and then the inside has plenty of uh, pockets as well as uh, fastening systems. So it's really good for managing and organizing gear. I do like it quite a bit for that. Uh, this one has um, a carbon fiber frame and you see one of the carbon stays here. Um, the, the way that you partially detach the pack and then uh, set up to put meat uh, in, uh, in this shelf area, it's not entirely intuitive, but it only takes a time or two to become proficient with it. And I like that. One challenge, though, is uh, once the meat is in here, it has a tendency to want to slide down and, because you're using the pack straps to really crank hold it tight. It, it does work, but sometimes you have to think about where you're putting your gear so you don't put too much tension across some gear if you don't want to have tension across it. So a great pack. I've, I've enjoyed using this quite a bit. And then ultimately I found myself wanting just to have that ability to take a longer trip. And for me, a long trip is probably five, six days uh, these days. Uh, I'm not really doing any expedition style stuff. So uh, I wound up with the um, Exo Mountain Gear K3 4800 pack, and this one um, is just great. One of the things I like about Exo Gear, or at least this one, is it's got these really uh, long pockets on the sides for spotting scopes or tripods, trekking poles, other things like that. Uh, a little bit more of a simplistic design, and uh, I chose Exo Mountain Gear for this reason, so I'm not going to say that any one of those top brands I mentioned is better than the other, but this one perhaps best for me because of some of the design features that those guys uh, put into uh, their packs at Exo Mountain Gear. So Steve and Mark aren't asking me to say any of these, these things, but what I would say first of all is their resources for uh, selecting a pack are outstanding and probably without uh, parallel. They've got so many videos and so many resources and they're so accessible as a company if you have questions before you buy. Uh, I liked that about them. The other thing that they do, um, perhaps the best in my opinion, is looking at or incorporating the element of ergonomics into the pack design so that their pack is, it allows you to form a narrow column close to the spine which is snug fitting, and you can adjust the fit really well on these, these packs, and very stable in both the frontal plane and the sagittal plane, but because that particular model has a titanium, uh, uh, tubular titanium or rod frame in it, it allows for flex just enough in that transverse plane, so as we're ambulating, having that natural rotation in our bodies, the pack moves with us, so we're not fighting the pack. And I know now they've gone to their K4 models, They've actually incorporated that element using carbon fiber. Uh, so shout out to those guys at EXO. Thanks for making a great pack and for making my life more comfortable. I appreciate that. Now, uh, when, when we think about all of these packs that we can choose, the, why I wanted to call this considerations is I wanted to talk about a few of the accessories or just ways we use the packs. And so in my line of work, I find that training becomes... Um, a very common use of the pack, and so any of any of these uh, the advanced packs, or even you know the frame pack, or the uh, 
uh, mystery ranks there works great for training. And so when when we're when we're using packs for training, one of the keys is of course uh, how we put the load in there. And uh, again, Exo's got a lot of great videos on how to do that, how to load your pack to get best waste weight distribution. But for training purposes, I'll tell most people if you're using the load shelf. Uh, on these packs, uh, and let's say you're going to use a sandbag or a weight plate, uh, the key is to get the weight pretty much in the mid back. You don't want the weight to hang too low, and you have to work to make it too high. But um, that's really important for again a good uh, maintenance of your uh, your body uh, or your center of mass over your base of support. So good for balance and actually uh, how you use your muscles when you're. When you're hiking now the what i like about the exo again giving these guys a pitch is uh, it's very intuitive how you simply detach you know quickly the uh, bag from the frame and then their meat shelf uh, has dedicated straps and buckles there for doing so so i like that some of the other brands also offer this but i think theirs is the easiest in my opinion it's one no, another reason why i purchased it well uh for a lot of times, though, for training, for some of these packs, uh, you, you can just use the pack bag itself. And so if you're going to do that, make sure you put a sleeping bag or a blanket, even a pillow, something like that, in the bottom. So when you drop in, let's say, a kettlebell or anything else, uh, that it doesn't sink all the way to the bottom. You have to, it's really valuable to do that. So I wanted to talk about loading the pack in that manner. Uh, also, I'd like to talk about workload progression. And guys send me uh, sometimes their, their training plans or ideas and say, hey, take a look at this. Tell me what you think. And usually it's, it's fairly good, but a lot of times they get stuck in this mindset of linear progression. So it's kind of week by week I'm going to be increasing um, the distance that I'm hiking in the pack, perhaps the speed that I'm doing, the challenge of the terrain, and the weight in the pack. So all those things are a rucking workload. And what I like to encourage folks to do is generally maybe only change one of those variables or increase one of those variables at a time. That allows your body to adapt and catch up. The other trick, though, as opposed to being uh, always increasing, is to plan in an occasional plateau in your training workload where you don't increase it for a week or so. And then occasionally, maybe every four to six weeks, a regression or a reduction in workload known as a deload or deloading phase. And that's going to be great because it's going to allow your body to catch up and super compensate and make those fitness adaptations without having so much risk of injury or breakdown. Okay, now if we think about what we're doing with training with these packs, most of that's going to be outside. It's great to get outside. It's great to just hike and on natural terrain. Once in a while, though, it's good to do interval training and a low-impact interval training method with these packs is to do hill repetitions. Wonderful trick. You can load the pack up with whatever you consider to be, let's say, uh, a moderate weight. And for most people, that's probably 40 to 60 pounds. And then you can simply power up a hill, walk around and down slowly and do repetitions on it with or without your trekking poles, depending. I think sometimes it's good to do some of your pack training with poles, some without their benefits to both, of course. Now, if you're in the gym, this is one of my favorite things to do occasionally. It's a great workout, only takes 20 minutes. Take that pack, load it with, again, let's say 40 to 60 pounds. Again, you can, you can choose to do less or more if you want. Get some 10 pound ankle weights, put them around each ankle and grab some 15 or 20 pound dumbbells. Set the treadmill at 15% greater incline, three miles per hour, and then you're going to do one minute on, one minute off. So just step on the treadmill at that speed it's safe to do, and you're just going to hike with the pack, with the dumbbells, with the ankle weights for a minute. Then step off, set the weights down, uh, mill around, catch your breath, and repeat. So this is really a very hunter specific type of interval training and folks will often ask why why the ankle weights I said, well if you've ever walked in uh wet snow or mud and your shoes or boots got heavy that you can see the value there obviously there's the pack there's the hill there's the incline and then with the uh, the dumbbells, you're actually getting some arm strength that's relatively functional because there are a lot of times when you might be doing some hard work with your poles or even carrying uh, 
bows, rifles, or, or shoveling meat where it's not in your pack and it's in your arm. So great way to train. And you can actually monitor progress by keeping all those variables fixed and simply looking at heart rate, both the heart rate during the work interval, what's it going up to, and also your heart rate recovery. How quickly does it come down to a lower, or maybe not resting, but just recovery level before you start again. So those are some, just some ideas I wanted to throw out there. Now, when we think about the packs and what we're doing with them, I've got a lot of choices here. One of the things I, I like to use is uh, like a belt pouch. And there's many brands and sizes and styles. And I only like one because I have some other reasons why I want uh, either one side free or available for another accessory. But um, these can be handy. They're great when you have something that you can... Uh, you want to put in, whether that's chapstick or sunscreen or spare ammunition, or even it could be a knife or something that's, uh, that you want to have access to so you don't want to take the pack off. So I, I love a pouch. This was a small one, but you get the idea there. Again, I've got, I've got tons of these things around, and I just grabbed what I could grab for the video. Uh, I would say most people should consider uh, having one of these. Now, the reason why I said I only wanted one was because I prefer, for the most part, to use handguns over pepper spray when I'm in bear country or for personal protection. And so, uh, having said that, I like to have the firearm on the belt. Um, I'm aware of you know, chest and shoulder rigs, also just for me, my preference is to be on the belt. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll use a Kydex type holster on the pack belt. And that's why I only have one gear pouch. Um, again, partly that's because I'm, I'm trying to spread weight around as well, what's in the pack, what might be on my uh, chest or bino harness. I, I don't like the whole kitchen sink thing across my front. Uh, so I typically run uh, a fairly clean bino harness set up with not too many uh, gadgets and, and pockets. But again, everyone has their preference. Well, back to this. Uh, what I like about the Kydex is they, uh, they, they hold tight. They're super light, first of all, you know, weatherproof and whatnot. And uh, usually uh, they'll have a, an ability to kind of fit around that backpack strap uh, quite well. And I'll often... Uh, or I'll always, excuse me, run strong side because in a cross draw situation, when you've got the pack on, you've got the straps packed down, it's actually hard to get across and access your firearm, whereas this way you know, you're going to be much uh, more quicker and efficient. Uh, one thing, or maybe two things to talk about these, uh, you may want to cover the bottom with a little tape or even make a little uh, closed cell phone plug or something to put in there. Reason being, if you set your pack down, and uh, you know the, the ground could be wet or snow, mud, whatever. You, you don't want to uh, end up uh, plugging the muzzle, and so just a good practice there. The other part of that, however, is we really, when we're wearing these firearms for bear protection in particular, we don't want to be without them, and so it's good to get in the habit of just quickly removing this and putting it on your person, on your belt. You have a good belt for that. But a lot of times, what I'll do again, if weight. Uh, and space considerations aren't extreme. Is I'll um, you know I'll just bring along a really light, uh, uh, like an Uncle Mike's or something a holster like this, and that way I can uh, take the firearm out and put this on. Simple enough for me. This this one's actually not uh, designed for the same uh, type of weapon as this one. Again, just because I grabbed it. But um, this I want to give that as a suggestion of where you carry your firearm and, and practice with it as well. Like practice uh, shooting, drawing and shooting while wearing the pack. Uh, quite critical to do so. Now, if we're if we're thinking about our packs and how we use them to carry, let's start with bows. Um, you know, most of the most all the packs that I just brought up there have any number of straps and configurations where you can safely and securely anchor uh, a bow, you know, whether that's um, vertically or if you're not in thick brush horizontally or up on top. Having said that, though, one of the things we have to think about is 
the arrows. And so most of us are typically running a, a quiver that's on the bow. And what you want to do is always make sure that you fasten uh, your bow on with uh, the arrows uh, in, in this uh, fletching up manner because uh, they're a little less likely to pop out and fall away in that case. And probably the, the way to make that even more certain is to take um, you know, just an extra strap, a strap attachment that again, all the pack manufacturers have and just, you know, and secure that because then you're not going to have the disappointment of taking your bow off and noticing you're a few arrows short or having to backtrack and find, try to find them. Uh, and all that's happened, I think, to all of us over time. So there's a tip, keep the bow vertical and secure the arrows. Uh, next up, we've got rifles. And that's probably where we've got a, a number of variations to think about. So first of all, one of the things that I like to do is just if I'm hiking and I know I'm not in hunting mode, I'll just strap my rifle on my pack and I'll just typically use either the center or the side straps and carry it. I just carry it muzzle up. It kind of depends on what you've got for muzzle treatments. You know, if you're running a longer barrel rifle with uh, a brake or suppressor, you have to be cognizant of that in uh, you know, more brushy areas, obviously. And so there's some things to think about there, but a lot of times I'll just, I'll do that. And then I've also used these uh, uh, rifle carriers, again, that most manufacturers will offer so that you can attach this kind of side middle, either side of a pack, and then uh, the buttstock will fit in there. And they usually have uh, you know, some type of a, like a, almost like a quick release up, uh, up at the top. So you're carrying your rifle on your pack. It's fairly snug and secure, but if you want to access it, you can pop this off and pull the rifle out for uh, service or duty. Um, good. You know, I, I've used these from time to time as well, but um, I'll still find myself using uh, a traditional carrying strap or sling. And uh, there are a lot of brands that have uh, you know, different features. This one's from Quake Industries. I've been using these for quite a long time. It's a kind of a rubberized uh, texture. It stays flexible even in cold weather, but it's really grippy. And so what I find is you're not fighting this. Most of the time if with, a, with a sling or carrying strap, technically is what it's called, uh, you know, it will have enough purchase on my shoulder or my backpack strap that I'm not working so hard using muscular energy, again, poor ergonomics too, uh, to keep that on. And one of the things that I think is great with some packs is how the, the stays are configured in the pack. So let me see if I can demonstrate this. Um, on this, uh, on this Kuyu, for example, and a lot of the packs, they have these horns uh, on the carbon stays where the pack then, you know, can slide, uh, slide over. When I'm walking, whether I'm carrying on one side or the other with the sling, uh, muzzle up, muzzle down, rifle back, rifle forward, there's a lot of ways that you can do this. But um, these allow you to get that sling, Let's see if I can show that, right here and it nestles and it won't fall off so now you can be almost hands-free and be secure in knowing that your rifle's not going anywhere um, that would be one of the things that i would recommend to uh, pack manufacturers if um, they actually perhaps you know whether they use some polymer or plastic uh, they built like a, a, a tiny little devil horn enough to catch or you know reinforce the fabric or maybe even uh, orient it so that the fabric drops a little bit uh, with the stitching before it goes across to, to provide that secure uh, place to hang a rifle just a tip that I, I don't know if anyone even cares but that's what I've come up with over all these years of walking all those miles with these firearms Okay, uh, let's talk about sitting pads or glassing pads, whatever you want to call them. There's some that are available commercially, nothing wrong with those. What I've tended to do over the years, though, is just simply use a small piece of closed cell foam. Uh, I can 
if I don't have a lot of stuff in my pack, I can put this in the pack, it's fine. But it can also just go out on the outside of the pack for strapping. Um, super light, super simple. That's kind of where I'm economizing. I'd rather spend money on uh, my packs and firearms than on my pad. Uh, but one uh, tip is to uh, run a string or a loop through it for retention purposes. So if you're strapping that on, you can run a strap through it and then you're not going to go some number of miles and find out that the thing's no longer there. Uh, that's just been uh, my experience. Okay, where to begin? This is exciting. Um, next up, uh, we've got uh, the, the thoughts about how to keep your pack and your gear relatively dry. <laughs> um, I like pack covers. Uh, not, I know not everyone uh, does, and you know, the packs can either drain or dry quickly, but I find, especially like in the spring during the bear season around here, weather changes five or six times a day, and so just simply pulling out uh, you know, one of these uh, backpack covers and popping it on. And there's so many of them that are available on Amazon or where have you, but um, I like them. They're great. They do a lot for me and keep my pack relatively dry so it doesn't get saturated or too heavy, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, just generally keeping the gear dry. Now that being said, there's always a place for a dry bag as well. Um, this one's uh, Sea to Summit. So if I'm, I guess I've got some uh, philosophies, like if I'm out in wet weather, rainy weather, I'm probably not gonna be using down, I'm gonna be using synthetics. Uh, but whenever I do have down, whether that's a sleeping bag or a puffy coat, it's got its own separate uh, stuff sack, a dry bag, because I just it's so important to keep those things dry. Uh, but that being said, you know you may have key elements of your gear that you want to keep uh, dry, and this one, uh, the Sea to Summit bag, is uh, good for that. This is a newer one. I think my older one has shown uh, quite a bit of wear. Um, if you're doing a lot of stream crossing or you're using a pack raft and things, you just want some, you have some critical elements that you want to make sure are dry and they can stay in the pack or even be out fine, good to do. Um, one temptation that I think some folks uh, do is to use or be tempted to use this as also as a food bag. Well, that's fine if you're going to use it as a food bag. Make sure you hang it well so the squirrels can't chew through it. But... I wouldn't then reuse it to put in your uh, shelter or tent with you uh, because of the food scent and the amazing uh, sense of smell that bears out. It's just not a good move. So whatever, if you have a food bag, keep that dedicated and keep it separate. And then uh, for a gear bag, make sure that it's not uh, used sometimes as a food bag. Now I'd like to talk about game bags. And so that's really one of the critical pieces of kit or gear that's unique to being a backcountry hunter. Um, over the years, they've gotten both lighter and stronger. There was a long time when we had the heavy canvas bags, which were really heavy. And also when they got wet, they got heavier. And then there were those uh, kind of stretchy mesh or cheesecloth type bags, which were almost throwaways. Uh, they just weren't that durable. Um, I I like the modern bags that you can uh, get. This one is, uh, I think it's caribou gear. Yes, yeah, a caribou gear. You can also get them from Argali, Graxol. Re really good. And, and these days, I'll usually suggest to most people to get the boned out uh, quarter sized bags because they're smaller and easier to manage. But then in your in your setup, take one large bag just in case. It's just easier to sometimes. Uh, put all the meat in there to secure the load or for hanging purposes, what have you. So uh, I, do, I like four small quarter bags and a large bag, maybe five, because sometimes I'm taking you know, organs, trim, other things. And there's nothing wrong with the old pillowcase. You know, these, um, especially if you've got like some really just old ones that have been retired and they were a cotton poly blend. Honestly, they're just about as light as anything else. Uh, my pro tip would be don't try to put an overhand knot uh, in the top because sometimes it can tighten too much. If you don't, if you have enough space, you can use a releasable knot. But um, otherwise, just have some cordage available to 
tie them off and works great. But uh, I like to have those types of game bags. And also I usually will bring one contractor bag just in case for whatever reason. Now it's obvious that you never want to put warm meat into um, a, a black contractor bag because it's going to heat it up and go sour. So uh, cool meat only, but if you get in those situations where you've got cooled meat and you need to put it inside the pack bag, um, or you're going to uh, submerge it in uh, a stream for cooling purposes. Again, once it's air cooled and you want to keep it cold, the, the, the contractor bag is great for that. So I like to uh, recommend it. And I think that's most of what I wanted to cover. I see one thing here that I forgot, and it's talking about trekking poles, for example. If you happen to have uh, a trekking pole uh, running on the side of your pack, you can use that to put that rifle sling over as well, just like I talked about that feature there. Well, one note though, be a little bit careful, especially if you have a rifle with a, like a nicely finished walnut stock or something, you don't want to scratch it up. So uh, just mention that these <laughs> things, not only these days do we use these for locomotion, uh, for setting up shelters, they've got just a lot of uh, uh, handy uses. So that's what I wanted to share today in this uh, backpack considerations for Backcountry Hunters video. Uh, guys, I hope you liked it. I hope you got something out of it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Until next time, Coach Jay-Z signing out from the Lifetime Athlete.